My name is Sherry Avila, and I will be your hostess today for Avila Fine Arts Lovers. And we have with us as our guest today, Dr. Roberto Severino. Dr. Roberto Severino is the curator of the Forbidden Books exhibit that is currently at Loyola University Museum of Art. Dr. Roberto Severino is Professor Emeritus of Italian Studies, Georgetown University, whose faculty he joined in 1973 and where he directed the Italian department for 15 years. And he is also the President Emeritus of the American University of Rome, where many Loyola University students, among others, have attended, including friends of my daughter. Dr. Severino is also the co-founder and past president of Copilas, an organization devoted to the promotion of Italian language and culture in the American schools, and twice he has presided over the Italian Cultural Society of Washington. Presently, he is chairman of the Education Committee and a member of the executive of the Washington, D.C.'s committees and sits on the board of many other organizations. Dr. Severino has published extensively both on literary criticism and pedagogy and has received many honors and awards, including the President of Italy's Gold Award and Diploma First Class uh, for the Benemeriti of Italian Culture. First and foremost, however, Professor Severino is a fine art and a rare book collector. Uh, before this Luma exhibition, he organized another major book exhibit held at Georgetown University and to which he contributed some of his own books. That exhibit was entitled Campania, Land of Myth and History, and focused primarily on the age of the Grand Tour to Italy. Now we're going to ask Dr. Severino uh, some questions about this exhibit. Uh, that you can see at Loyola University Museum of Art at 820 North Michigan, across from the water tower. Dr. Severino, who organized this exhibit? And could you explain who these two organizations are? Uh, mainly it was sponsored and financed by the Campania uh, Rare Museums uh, and the Library Department in the person of Dr. Loredana Conti. And then the, there were four major uh, library contributing books from a lover campaign for Naples and uh, Salerno and other places. And then it was co-sponsor and organized here in, in the United States. The liaison organization was Italian Muse, which interacted between the Campania region and the museum, the Luma Museum. Now, what does this exhibit contain? Well, as uh, the title itself says, is really a an exhibition of books dealing primarily in the framework, historical framework of 1550 to 1750, the topics science and faith, and basically how these two disciplines, uh, these areas of uh, human uh, thought, inter interacted during the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. So these books that you have in the exhibit are from approximately 1570 to 1770, did you say? 1550 to 1750. Oh, 1550, 1750, thereabouts. Approximately, yes. And uh, one significant point might be, when was the Gutenberg press uh, create invented? Well, the uh, Gutenberg... Or how did that relate to Yes, this? Gutenberg, of course, operated in the middle of the 15th century, primarily. So, and he published, of course, the great masterpiece, which is the two-volume Bible, of the Gutenberg, so-called Gutenberg Bible, which is very, very, is a monument printing, really. For the first time, movable types were used in, in the Western, in the Western so countries. So, therefore, if some of these books that uh, exist even today that survived this censorship, mm -hmm. uh, they must be particularly rare because uh, how many copies would you have saved would, that, would have there have been of the original? Uh, well, uh, in the first, in the last part of the 15th century, so we are talking about from Gutenberg to 1500 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. approximately, uh, very few were produced actually because they were mostly larger size, everything had to be handmade. Okay. So the numbers probably would be between two and three hundred each volume. 
so that's, that's why they're so scarce. Later on, however, smaller size were de developed, and there were many more printing houses, also printing, and, and so uh, we have a larger edition, but not really more than 500 copies usually. Mm -hmm. So they're also mostly of them are very rare. Now, uh, why were these books censored? What historical uh, event took place that? Uh, created this situation. Well, uh, as far as uh, Europe is concerned, of course, it was the counter, the first the Reformation, the Lutheran Reformation, and then the reaction to the Reformation, which was called the Counter Reformation. And uh, the, uh, in Italy, in particular, uh, we felt uh, it was felt the influence of the Counter Reformation was felt because the papacy was there, and uh, therefore uh, many books ended up by being put on prohibited lists, uh, their readings and ownership was proscribed, it was in, and, uh, and an index of prohibited books was created. So the Counter-Reformation occurred, and was there some kind of uh, authority figure of, of the Pope? Was he the one that uh, created this uh, a special group? Yes, and um, Luther was, uh, was excommunicated in, in 1520. Uh, and then uh, his ideas began spreading in Italy too, in fact, among the clergy too. So the church uh, saw this as a very uh, pressing danger to the existence of the church. Uh, there were precedents. In 1453, Byzantium, the old Byzantium, had fell into the Muslims. Uh, the, Luther, the Lutheran reform, the Anglican reform later on, which followed immediately. Therefore, the church tried to defend itself by creating first uh, by a council, the Council of Trent, to discuss a possible reconciliation, but reality was a form of entrenchment against the, the so-called perceived enemy of the Church. Now, what happened to some of these authors and some of these publishers who published these books that were censored, and why, uh, what specific uh, process was there that determined whether they would be censored? Oh, yeah. First of all, the book said to be denounced to uh, an important figure of the church. It could be a bishop, it could be a cardinal, it could be somebody in church, an abbot. And then uh, this denunciation had to be circumstantiated, it had to be explained why the book was considered really unacceptable to, as far as uh, Catholic canons and beliefs were concerned. And then a commission would then rule on its inclusion on this list or not. Uh, what happened to the uh, to the writer themselves. Sometimes they were asked to amend the book, so it may appear on the index of one time and then taken out if it had been amended, was expurgated without the permission of the author itself. The author would be excommunicated or, or put on probation. Or uh, so there are different measures. Very often uh, books were publicly banned and burned. Burned. The books were burned. Can we bring up that image of the books being burned, please? And, and uh, occasionally the author is imprisoned or, or worse, like in case of Giordano Bruno and others. So where would you say this uh, began and what uh, geographical location? Well, did it begin in Italy then? The process of a book burning? Of, 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 of forbidden books, forbidden the book. burning? Well, actually, the uh, censorship. Uh, if you read the, all the various editions of the indexes, which have been published since 1559 approximately, the first one to actually include the word index in it, there were other lists published before, to the last edition which was published of the index, which is uh, 1948, although the index itself was proscribed, it was ceased to exist in 1966 by order of Pope Paul VI. So in 1948, the Pope said that it should no longer exist. No, in no, 1966. In 1966, 66, the Pope. But the last, yes, Pope Paul VI. Oh. But in the last, edi the last is published edition okay. of the book itself okay. is 1948, although between 1948 and 1966, books were added to occasional lists. Mm -hmm or published in journals uh, in a, uh, mm -hmm. waiting for a new edition of the index. But then the Pope said, let's mm -hmm. not publish that anymore. Uh, I was saying, if you read any of those editions, uh, mostly in the introduction given some of them, they refer to a burning of the books which occur, occur in the Bibles, really, in the Acts of the Apostles uh, in 1919, 
there is a uh, talks about uh, St. Paul is preaching in Ephesus uh, which uh, now is in Turkey but used to be part of Greek was a Greek town then and then uh, the, if it, uh, he urged the burning of some books which were dealing with the occult and magic practice and the, the apparently the people did that and they burned their own books now the um, the Bible uh, account seems to be exaggerated because he uh, says that they were worth at least 50,000 pieces of silver which was in a in her arm or some amount of money and then most people didn't know how to read or write so uh, uh, not too many books were really very pressed but it was just a precedent in the case but it was a voluntary burning and there were no consequences that was the main difference between oh. the biblical account and, and then what followed uh, in the, during the oh the I see council, that's, the that's interesting because yeah. I know there have been other cultures I know in the uh, Mexican culture that the Spaniards came and yes, burned and destroyed the books. and destroyed a lot of the Aztec May Mayan yes, uh, it was books. A great treasure was lost that way. Great culture. And so there are other cultures who have burned books, but you're saying yeah. that in this case, when the books were burned, they were actually burned uh, voluntarily. Voluntarily by the owners, following St. Paul's uh, preaching. Following his encouragement, <laughs> encouragement <yes. laughs> strong encouragement. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> But again, no consequences were uh, for the authors of the honors, mm -hmm. uh, which of course was not the case mm -hmm. later on. So you're saying they could amend the book, they could change it, and they could change. get off that list. Yes, yes, they could. In fact, very often there is such a current. You see a book in one index, and then you don't see that anymore, uh, or it comes back if certain things. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, now, w you said it initially started in Italy. But then other archdioceses in other countries also followed suit. Well, it did not start in Italy, really. It uh, started possibly in Spain oh. in the 14th century, but the, okay. uh, and then in Italy too, in France. Okay. But these uh, were local, local uh, groups, uh, local okay. uh, bishop or maybe sometimes, or mm -hmm. local cities mm -hmm. that would prescribe those books. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happened uh, started in Italy was a, a universal, so-called Roman index. Mm -hmm which then was to be applied to all the Christianity, to mm -hmm. Catholic Christianity. Now, uh, I took a class with you at Loyola University Museum of Art, uh, and I don't know if you remember this one lady that got up. She's a friend of mine. Her name's Mary Griffin. Yes, yes. And uh, she had said that in 1905, they wrote a book called The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Yes. And around the 50s or early 60s, it might have been, she was writing her master's thesis yes, yes. on this book. And at that time, she was told, and this was in the early 60s here in Chicago, Illinois, in the United States, mm -hmm. that she had to get permission from her priest yes, yes. to write her master's thesis mm -hmm. on the jungle by Upton Sinclair. Yeah. I think it was published a little later, if I recall in the 20s, late 20s. But again, I'm not sure about the day. But true, uh, again, as I said, this book, uh, as far as we know, was not put on the index. Now, as far as we know, because there, was, there were revisions and additions that were contemplated after 1948, but until 1948 was never put in there. However, uh, books could be prohibited by local church authority, and that probably was the case, because uh, the fact that, that the book had received permission to be printed, uh, Neil Hobstadt, uh, or actually to, to go ahead, uh, the permission to be printed, like in Primatur, uh, didn't mean that it was automatically accepted by other church of office officials elsewhere. So the, the church officials, the high church, had their own jurisdiction over their own territory. So there was an official printed list, but in addition to that, there were other uh, less formal lists, uh, and perhaps not published. This certainly before, certainly before the Roman Tridentine Index. Afterwards was an occasional occurrence, but there were groups or orders that, that actually mm -hmm. they were much more strict than other ones, and uh, that's probably what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how did some of these censored books survive if some of them were burned voluntarily Not or with great encouragement? <laughs> and uh, perhaps what happened to the, How did they survive? Well, uh, First of all, censors themselves uh, were supposed to read them in order to censor them. Mm -hmm. So certain books were, uh, by special permission, you could keep them in libraries. So mm -hmm. most of the books, in fact, that came from to this show, came from monastic libraries, even though they were even though they were forbidden books. I see. Now they're controlled, perhaps put in special places, 
Uh, I don't know if you recall, but when I went to college, I remember there was a so-called cage in Catholic mm -hmm. schools where mm -hmm. you, you they lock up books that they didn't want to destroy them, but they still you need special permission to read them and all that. So many of them were smuggled out of the country. Many of the Italian writers uh, during the Counter-Reformation published elsewhere. They published in Frankfurt and Basel and other places where they could. So many editions, although by Italian authors, were published smuggled abroad, including the last book of Galileo Galilei was published uh, abroad. So there was a way of circumventing things. Yeah. So many of the books were not published in Italy or in the countries or in the cities where they were being censored. Mm -hmm. They were published in yes, another yes, area yes, or yes, geographical yes. area. In fact, uh, uh, the first index was very strict about that. When I said the first thing, I'm referring to the 1559. Be anything that came from uh, country which was not Italy, basically, or was a country mm -hmm. which was infected by, by the new religious ideas, was automatically <laughs> uh, prescribed, or probably prohibited, and so was it. And then it beca then became a lax a little bit. That they tried to make uh, some distinctions, so that mm -hmm. certain certain things could be read with special permission, so. Now, what happened to some of these people, though? The, the authors. Uh, you said that sometimes they went out of the country to print. But if they had already published, or or what happened to the? Did some of the publishers get? Um yes, my books uh, pub published themselves were also part of uh, punished severely for publishing uh, this type of books. Librarians, uh, actually libraries, and booksellers was also were also punished if they had books of the sort. Uh, but this was not just in Italy; this occurred elsewhere because uh, there is a case of a bookseller in England who actually was killed because he had the prescribed books. A uh, bookseller in England? Uh, yes, in a, a later on actually in the in the eighteenth century. Uh, because it was a book concerning Queen Mary uh, which of course was uh, the enemy perceived as an enemy of the okay. ruling house and it had been prohibited but he had it in his store so So uh, this gets involved in politics, mm. control and power. Absolutely. Yeah. Nothing has changed. <laughs> Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Now, um, let's see, we talked about they were, mo uh, initially they were mostly censored in Europe in general then. Yes, yes. And they started out in Spain, you were saying. Well, uh, the, the, no, the censorship really was more severe in Spain because the Inquisition was born in Spain, mm -hmm. although then became a, a papal institution also during the Council of Trent, and the first prefect of this, uh, the Inquisition, where it became widely accepted then the church was a pope was Pope Paul the fourth uh, so but uh, in Egypt, Spain we had this problem because also there was a political problem uh, to with the Muslim even there uh, with the uh, national unity and all that and so there were some uh, and then uh, this this list were only locally of course uh, imposed so to speak mm -hmm. uh, applied and punishment too but if you are talking about punishments, well, uh, if you want to take the case of Galileo Galilei, who actually had got in trouble, uh, the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei, because he really propounded the heliocentric s system, the truth of the heliocentric system, versus the Ptolemaic. The Ptolemaic was the geocentric, the, what the Bible literally said. And uh, so since his ideas were not uh, presented as an hypothesis, but as a true fact, he was able to ascertain that by studying through the telescope he had adapted to, to the study of astronomy. Then he got in trouble. The Inquisition went after it. After it and There's Gal Galileo up there. Oh, yes. <laughs> so as I understand it then, his theory was okay yes. until he proved yes. his Th theory. Once he proved his yes. theory, yes. he was in trouble. He was exhorted by Carlo Bellarmine, who was Jesuit, who was at the head of the of his tribunal, to say to all this a theory only. Is an hypothesis actually mm -hmm. what he said, mm -hmm. and of course he said no, but actually it's not an hypothesis, and, and so he tried to justify itself uh, uh, by saying that uh, uh, basically the, the, there is only one truth that does not contradict the Bible. Mm -hmm. the, what may occur that some of what is written in the Bible might be mistakenly interpreted, mistakenly by interpreted. interpreted. Actually, I, that was one of the points that I remember from your talk at Loyola University, 
that you uh, talked about, uh, and this surprised me when I, I am a docent there, and when I was showing the, the forbidden books, I saw these Bibles and I was like, why are the Bibles in the forbidden books? And you explained that a little bit last night, and I'd like you to explain it to the public well, here. Uh, why <laughs> would Bibles be in the forbidden books? In fact, in the first edition of the index, the 1559, um, about four pages out of about ten pages, it was slim, slim index. Only 1,000 titles were listed. About four pages are only Bibles and New Testaments. And these were Bibles written primarily, uh, or exclusively, I would say, in a, in a vernacular language, not in Latin. Uh, the Church, of course, want to control doctrine, want to control theological interpretation of the Bible. And it was the custodian of the of the, of the faith, so to speak. And so uh, a Bible in vernacular that anybody could read and, and interpret was a dangerous thing because many things were put into question then. And so that's why they're prescribed. Now, that's good. Uh, we have several images here that we'd like to share with the public and talk mm -hmm, about. Mm -hmm. So why don't we start with some of these images. Mm -hmm. uh, we could start with the Copernicus image, and, mm -hmm. and you'd like to say something about that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. As I was mentioned before... Uh, is image number seven, I think? Mm -hmm. yeah. As I was mentioned before, um, Galileo got in trouble for really sharing and proving Copernicus' theory of heliocentrism, of the sun being the center of our planetary system, or the universe, as they said then. Uh, he was not Italian, he was Polish, uh, from Turin. Uh, he published this uh, masterpiece, master, masterpiece in 1543, but again, it had not been proved. So he was not really unduly persecuted or censored. And he was actually a canon. He was a, was a member of the church himself. Uh, then when Galileo, of course, <laughs> got, uh, was able to prove it, then, then, then uh, the, the heliocentrism interpretation was, was completely considered uh, taboo and condemned. Now, uh this exhibit is also called the science and faith between observance and censorship. You can take down that image. Frank, you can take down that image. Uh, and it's called, the exhibit is also called science and faith between observance and censorships. And it, I understand, re includes rare books as well as the forbidden books. Mm -hmm. uh, but you said that you wanted to talk a little bit about, or have we uh, covered what you want to cover on the faith Heart. Well, no, the faith actually is the major component of the exhibition. Okay. Uh, the book, uh, the exhibition itself contains about 140, 150 books, I'm going to recall it. Oh, fact. yes, and we were going to show your book. Uh, could you bring up his book on the screen, please? The book uh, that he and uh, Luma, I believe, uh, uh, cooperatively uh, wrote. Uh, this is the book uh, that a lot of these images uh, are, are coming from and a lot of this uh, information. Uh, is coming from. Would you like to speak to your book or mm -hmm. talk about your yeah, book? Yeah, uh, this is a very nice catalog of the exhibitions which uh, was produced in actually in Campania by various scholars in Campania, librarians of the four contributing libraries participating in it. Uh, it contains very various introductions including one from Father Garanzini who is the president of Loyola University, one uh, from uh, on this side, of course, we have also uh, uh, Pamela Ambrose, who is the director of the Luma Museum, and then uh, other office officials, uh, including the president of Campania from Italy mm -hmm. and Dr. Conti also. Mm -hmm. um, and it is divided really uh, into main sections, one on science, one on faith. The science uh, contains only about 50 books, whereas the faith almost doubled that. Yeah. And uh, there are subdivisions, of course. Uh, the faith, if you want to talk about the faith a little bit, uh, is, is divided in two main sections. One section uh, deals with the general principle, theological principle, Bibles, including some of the forbidden Bibles, to speak with vernacular. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, there is a, a very large section on, uh, on popular beliefs and how the theology change. Uh, let me make a case, in, uh, an example. Uh, Naples, of course, uh, is in southern Italy. It was for many centuries under Spanish inform, Spanish domination. So there was a Spanish feeling to their belief, which is very popular, very open in the square, so to speak. 
they believe in San Gennaro, who is the patron saint of Naples, which theologians are not sure whether it exists or not, but they, for them is their patron saint. Their and patron saint is? Of Naples. Of Naples, Naples yes. yes. And San Gennaro. Saint Gennaro. Saint Gen Gennaro. Gennaro, which etymologically could be interpreted as Januarius, Januarius, Gen January, basically. A pagan god which uh, had two two faces, one looking f oh, yes. to the future, one looking yes. to the back. Yes. So there was some form of syncretic trans transmission of some of those mm -hmm. ideas into the Christian, uh, the new Christian faith. Mm -hmm. But the Neapolitans really believe it. They are very devoted to Saint Gennaro, uh, and and at that time, especially in Naples, there was a, a, a very strong cult for the Madonna, the Madonna, which uh, before that. Uh, before the 12th century, really, because Don Scotus was a great philosopher, uh, propounder, propounder of the cult of Madonna. Uh, it had been put really in a secondary uh, tier, so to speak, because really Christ is the central figure. But then the Neapolitans believed in, in, in the Madonna, and so the, we had a different aspect of this Madonna being different cults around the Madonna. Madonna, the Madonna is the queen. Uh, with a snake under her feet, uh, crushing heretics and that. So uh, she's the queen of the uh, heavens. Then we have Madonna, who is uh, the mother, then the nativity scene. Then we have Madonna, the sorrow, uh, with the dying son, and all that. So all this, this aspect in Naples flourish. And there were different uh, churches or convents or monasteries cultivating particularly this cult. Part of our Darcy collection, permanent Darcy collection, includes several of these Madonnas, <coughs> uh, partly because, of course, we have a lot of these pieces mm -hmm. from the Renaissance yes, era, of course, of course. which was when it was very course, common. The we're, iconography was there. We're coming towards the end of our 29-minute <laughs> <laughs> show, <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I'd like you to make some closing statements. And uh, before you make the closing statements, I'd like to say real quick that uh, if anybody wants to see this wonderful exhibit on the uh, forbidden books, uh, rare books. Uh, it can be found at Loyola University Museum of Art, which is located at 820 North Michigan, across the street from the water tower. And it's uh, that particular exhibit is on the third floor of the museum, third floor. Uh, so would you like to say some closing remarks very, now? Very briefly, that uh, of course every idea is always, always re related to the time. Those were different times. Now the church has changed because they believed in different things now. Uh, in, as in the case of Galileo, uh, Pope Paul the, John the, uh, the Second uh, really uh, asked the Pontifical Academy of Science to review the Galileo case, and he himself, in his speech, said that, that uh, truth is only one. Truth is only, is only one. one. So, if scientific truth is proven and contradicts what the written word of the Bible is, then the interpretation of that written word must be reviewed now, and was revised. Did Galileo get? Executed? No, okay. he was, he was, Galileo was put in, in uh, possibly, uh, we are not sure, he probably was tortured uh, briefly, but he was put then in a solitary consignment, his own house in Arcetri in the hills of Florence. That's where he died. But he was very good Catholic and Christian, and two of the only. My name is Sherry Avila, and I will be your hostess today for Avila Fine Arts Lovers. And we have with us today, as our guest, the authority on rare books, Dr. Roberto Severino. And now, we're, Dr. Roberto Severino is a professor emeritus of Italian studies, Georgetown University whose faculty he joined in 1973 and where he directed the Italian department for 15 years. And he's also the president emeritus of the American University of Rome, where many Loyola University students, among others, have attended, including friends of my daughter, Audrey. Dr. Severino is also a co-founder and past president of Copilas, 
an organization devoted to the promotion of Italian language and culture in American schools, and twice he has presided over the Italian Cultural Society of Washington. Presently, he is chairman of the Education Committee and a member of the executive of the Washington, D.C.'s committees and sits on the board of many other organizations. Dr. Severino has published extensively both on literary criticism and pedagogy and has received many honors and awards, including the President of Italy's Gold Medal and Diploma First Class for the Bernamiretti of Italian Culture. First and foremost, Professor Severino is a fine art and rare book collector. Before his Luma Collection exhibit, he organized another major book exhibit held at Georgetown University and to which he contributed some of his own books. That exhibit was entitled Campania, Land of Myth and History, and focused primarily on the age of the Grand Tour to Italy. Now, Dr. Severino, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about your exhibit. This is actually our second show with Dr. Severino. And I met Dr. Severino at Loyola University Museum of Art when he gave a lecture. I'm one of the docents there. Uh, Dr. Severino, uh, we talked a little bit about the uh, religious aspects of the Forbidden Books in our last show. And in this show, we'd like to, first of all, we'd like to remember for you to show your, we're going to show his, the book that Dr. Severino wrote in conjunction with Luma or Loyola University Museum of Art. And would you like to talk about your book, please? Uh, yes, actually, it's not my book. It's the catalog which was produced uh, in Italy by the curators of the four libraries which have lent the books. I helped organize the show and uh, did most of the translations, uh, or at least editing most of the translations because of the, it's a bilingual, a bilingual catalog, uh, uh, very well illustrated. So anyone who goes to see the show, I'm sure this catalog will be available to them. They'll find it helpful. Mm -hmm. um, you can take the image down. Uh, the uh, book is uh, very uh, extensive. It talks about, what is it, five uh, divisions you have, or five no, sections? No, actually, or? two main sections. Two main sections. Two main sections. One, of course, is uh, science, and the other one is faith. Science okay. and faith in the age of the Counter-Reformation, basically, mm -hmm. that's the general topic, yes. And, and we spoke briefly, we can go back, of course, to some of the points um, last, in the last uh, taping about the religious aspect, the religious books. Uh, very important uh, aspect, of course, was also scientific development and how the Counter-Reformation really uh, conditioned this development, especially in Italy, mm -hmm. especially in Italy. Italy had many, many scientists who were at the cutting edge of discoveries, uh, research, and then uh, if, unfortunately, their research would contradict the literary, literary interpretation of the Bible, then their research uh, discoveries will be, of course, questioned and curtailed. Is so this was a threat when the scientist uh, came up with an idea uh, that might actually have some basis uh, because it would possibly or probably contradict mm -hmm. what was in the Bible. Particularly in ast astronomy, yes, of course. Okay, because so... Uh, the belief of the, that was okay. the literal interpretation of the Bible being the sen the heart of the, okay. the geocentric, the Ptolemaic interpretation okay. of the system, whereas scientists realized, not just mm -hmm. in Renaissance, even before that, uh, that the, the sun really was the center of our planetary system. Uh, when I say before that, we can go back to Seneca. Seneca, who lived uh, uh, from a few years before the, uh, the death of Christ to after, but so the first century, basically, the Roman era, uh, he actually writes in his treatise on the comets that we have to really be careful. And this is also the Greek expand some of the Greek ex expanded this theory that uh, the sun uh, was a fixed star basically, and the other uh, mm -hmm. bodies were moving, including the Earth mm -hmm. around the, the sun. It's kind of interesting because uh, now we know that there are many suns. Uh, or stars that are also suns, or, or is it suns that are also stars? Course, course. 
So knowledge is always uh, relative to time yes. when it's developed and it's finite, really, basically. Yes. Because we don't know until new discoveries yes. are continually made. Yes. Uh, that's an interesting point we can talk about later. So basically, the scientific uh, section is a, a rich. Uh, uh, it could be a little bit controversial because some of those, those uh, topics and uh, ideas and controversy could be also transposed in modern times with stem cell research, with other things, other things. Yeah, we, we're not going to go into that because we are going <laughs> to stick to the 16th century, basically. Okay. Yes. Uh, science wasn't one of my favorite subjects. However, I have deep respect for science, and the older I get, I have more respect. Uh, and so I understand how important the scientists were, and actually, yes. I actually recognize a few names. <laughs> uh -huh. <That's laughs> so I'm not a scientist myself, but <laughs> I've read a few books. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, would you like to talk about Isaac Newton? Well, I mean, because he's not Italian, he was English. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but very, very important, of course, for the. He came actually after many of the other okay. people we've been discussing. Okay. But, uh, he published very important things around 1680s, 1690s, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the exhibit has a book of Newton, which was uh, actually published in Italy in Padua, which was a center, a very important center of research. But uh, Newton, Isaac Newton, of course, uh, was concerned prim primarily with motion, again the astronomy also, mm -hmm. and the, the, th the theory and the principle of uh, gravity of. Uh, so uh, basically, the fallen, the body is yes. falling. Yes, I think that's something mm -hmm. even elementary school yes, children yes, are yes, taught. Uh, yes, we all remember uh, the apple. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Isaac Newton is uh, yes. well known. Yes. Now, uh, who else would you like to talk about, or well, what uh, other? Uh, well, there are many, many scientists in many fields. What really about some of the ones that we have? Some uh, the pictures. Of, do you want to? Talk about Copernicus again, or would you like well, to talk Copernicus about Copernicus is important because it was the very first one really to, mm -hmm. to put in writing a comprehensive uh, uh, theory, if let's call it theory, mm -hmm. because he had not been Copernicus able to. Copernicus is an image number seven. To prove of uh, the heliocentric system, meaning the sun being at the center. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, unfortunately, when Galileo then was able, or fortunately, when Galileo was able to prove, then he had to suffer the consequences. But he was not the only one. Uh, Campanella, for instance, another Italian philosopher, uh, for this and other ideas, politically primarily, because, but uh, he was put in jail for nearly 30 years. Who was this? It was Tommaso Campanella, okay. a, con a contemporary. Uh, we can take that image down. Uh, another one, Giordano Bruno, uh, was actually at the end for this and other idea. Burn at stake in sixteen. Who was this? Giordano Bruno. Bruno. Sixteen hundred. Okay. So basically, there is some. Uh, so Bruno was burned at the stake. Yes. So he was one of the scientists. In sixteen hundred. In the sixteen. Well, he was not a scientist. He was a philosopher. Philosopher. A, a writer. He wrote also tried right. comedies, theater plays. Mm -hmm. But he basically a philosopher. And uh, and then. Uh, so he, they really he found he him threatening. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, for many many reasons. Uh, so uh, possibly was homosexual, we don't know yet. Uh, possibly was, because some of the content of his comedies and right, mm -hmm. they dealt with that. Mm -hmm. So he was, was an un uncomfortable person to have around, mm -hmm. and he was dealt with uh, with certain severity yes, mm -hmm. in 1600. Mm -hmm. So burned at the stake. Uh, yeah. What, what, what happened, in the, as far as science is concerned, and also theology, but generally science, we, have, we can trace a line, really, uh, all the way back to the uh, to the to the Greek philosophers, uh, we have uh, the Aristotelian line. Uh, great savant, of course, he was he was an unbeliever, uh, uh, great teacher, uh, and he was really we consider him the head of the prescriptive, the prescriptive uh, interpretation of things. Mm -hmm. Basically, he was the authority, and this uh, that's why Aristotle. Was became so important in a Christianized form by St. Thomas during the Counter Reformation because it was the authority that could not be questioned to a degree. And then we have also the Platonic line. The Platonic line. Is Aristotle, is this Aristotle here? No, this is Aristoxen. Oh, okay, it's different. Okay. Yeah. He was a student. Aristo he can show this picture. Okay. Uh, would you like to bring up uh, number 15? Exact sciences, Aristoxen. Ari Ar Aristoxen, see. And uh, he was uh, image number fifteen, and uh, 
You can talk to him. Uh, you, about, you, or you, 13, I'm sorry. 13. It's image number 13. Go on. Aristoxen uh, was, uh, it's not very well known. He's known only for this book. Mm -hmm. because the other books that he wrote were lost. Mm -hmm. He was a pupil of Aristotle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so we're talking about the 4th century BC. Uh, but he was born actually in what is today Italy, in Taranto. At that time, it was a part of the Magna Greek, and by Magna Grecia was uh, the Greeks have been the New World, of mm -hmm, course. Mm -hmm. Many, many places in southern Italy especially were, uh, were settled by the Greeks. And so was the greater Greece, the Maya Greece was a great, a little bit like the European settled mm -hmm. America. So we traveled in Italy and we traveled in Greece, and I know it's just a hop, skip, and a jump. Yes, uh, of course, from Italy of course, to Greece. of course. At that time, maybe it took so longer. To speak. Yes, <laughs> smaller ships, <laughs> but yes. So many, many of the cities down there that uh, they are now Italian, of course, they were all created uh, mm -hmm. by the founded by the Greeks, mm -hmm. like Syracuse, it was uh, very powerful at the time. Archimedes lived in Syracuse. Uh, Tarant Taranto, where uh, Stockton he was from, uh, uh, Pythagoras had a school near there, the Pythagor Pythagorean school. Mm -hmm. uh, Napoli, Naples was the ne Neapolis, the new town. So really was the Greek thought. So basically, I was going to say that, that two currents of philosophy, of philosophical thought, uh, running down from Aristotle or for Plato. Plato. It was really the more the higher believer, if you want. He believed in the, in the creation, the creative process in a way. Uh, but Aristotle was a skeptic, and yet paradoxically, Aristotle was Christianized by Saint Thomas uh, during the Renaissance, especially mm -hmm. of course Saint Thomas in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. But then that uh, re re established, uh, reinforced, so to speak, in the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Well, should we bring up some more of the images? Maybe mm -hmm. number ten, astronomy and astrology. Uh, Yes, uh, this is a book by Le Poix. Image is number 10. He's a Frenchman, Le Poix. Yeah. And he, he was concerned, of course, uh, he, with uh, comets. Comets, uh, they were seen as a non scientific occurrences. There were ominous appearances, sometimes good. Of course, the comet that guides the, the three kings to uh, the newborn Christ, all that. But really, we're seen. Uh, uh, and then he tried to explain them scientifically. Uh, so there was a new, really it was a new search for the uh, occurrences work in the cosmic astrology, astrological terms. Again, he was propounder of the earth being round mm -hmm. and the sun being the center. Whereas the rest of the world thought the, wor the earth was flat, right? Well, uh, or part of the world. Part of the world. Part of the people and some the world. Some of the, even in ancient Greece didn't believe that. In some of the, some mm -hmm. of them didn't believe that. So, uh, now, I think the public might be interested in uh, some of the, uh, well, maybe we should talk about some of the exact sciences before we get into uh, some of these other things. Uh, so, uh, well, we see, we talked about, uh, hmm, maybe we did talk about most of those. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, oh, no, we didn't. Uh, what about uh, Giovanni? Giovanni Arcolano? Mm -hmm. Arcolano. Oh, uh, yeah, he was born, uh, Giovanni Arcolano was uh, born in uh, Verona. And uh, he was That's a, number 15. a famous uh, uh, physician, a uh, particularly known for his surgical skills. So probably, if that's the plate you're showing, is the, the surgery instruments that he developed. And uh, there are many, many more that he developed. So he really advanced surgery to, to a large extent. Of course, limited to the knowledge at the mm -hmm, time, mm -hmm. but he was a great teacher and a great surgeon. So you're saying that these particular instruments, now this is, is this part of the forbidden book or is this a rare book? Well, it, it is a rare book. Now, what became forbidden or is it both? <laughs> was the fact that they were became suspicious, some of the books dealing with the human body. For instance, in the show, we have an exhibition, we have a wonderful folio book, a very large book by Vesalius. Uh, now, Vesalius was not Italian, he was Flemish. Mm -hmm. But he taught in Italy. He was a professor of Padua. Mm -hmm. And this, this, this is prints of the human body and also the nervous system. They are amazing, even by today's okay, standards. Okay, um, let's see what uh, image is it that we have that has that? Uh, oh, number yes, 18. That's one. Number 18 yeah. has the human body. Yeah, this, this actually the nervous system, of the, which was an amazing feat to reproduce in such, in such details. What they had to do, of course, they had to contravene some of the churches order not to deal with uh, corpses and uh, anatomical dissections. Yes, Be and I know that was brought up at your lecture that 
uh, somebody wrote a book, or is this the same one, uh, of where they had actually uh, dissected dogs? No, that was a gal Galen. Oh, okay. Galen was in okay. Roman, Roman time. Because, but still, there, were, there was a, the sacrality of the human body was such, mm -hmm. including the church. Mm -hmm. Also because the Catholic Church, the Christian Church, uh, Catholic in particular, believed that resurrection, uh, when the resurrection will occur of our body mm -hmm. at the end of the world, you need your body to resurrect. So for a long time they, they were even very against the cre cremation of things. Now things are changing a little bit on that. Because, but the lurid interpretation mm -hmm. was that you need your bones, your bones, mm -hmm. your skeletons, your, your human remains to resurrect. So was the book with the body, uh, the uh, uh, nervous system, right? Yes. Well, that, the book that's with one, the nervous one system in it, was that uh, considered um, a forbidden book then? Well, or what happened was this: the many of these books that physicians uh, used to, uh, they had study on and used them, were all prescribed and forbidden because of that. Okay, so because Pre many, many because of the or question, the question, yeah, uh, and therefore, in fact, there was a, there was a, a, almost a petition signed by many Italian physicians mm -hmm. to the to the church authorities saying, "These are the books we study on. We need them to mm -hmm. to conduct our business. Basically, don't take them away from us, because mm -hmm. uh, really was going back rather than going forward in, in terms mm -hmm. of history sciences." I think we face some of those same challenges today with some. Sometimes. Uh, printed material yes, or yeah. uh, yeah. uh, now let's can we talk or would it be possible to talk about the uh, is this taking a bath or sanitation <laughs> it's sanitation yes uh, uh, in fact it's called uh, number 17 if, uh, if I recall that the, that uh, that woodcut there is taken from, from an early edition of the re re regime and sanitatis. And was it unacceptable to take a bath? Or? No, no, it was not. But it was unusual for sure. Unusual to take <laughs> a bath. It was unusual to take a bath. Uh, but uh, the, the reason why this book was put in the, on the, in the exhibition was because in Italy, especially in Campania, especially in the city of Salerno, it, they developed a very famous medical school, the Medical School of Salerno which was very, very advanced. Now, the, the compiler of this regime and sanitatum, regime sanitatis, was a Spaniard who collected all these in verses, all the various advice that could be given to people in terms of uh, their health and, and uh, food and practice. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, now, what about the plants? Uh, uh, plants. Number 16, uh -huh. image 16? Yes. Image 16 is, comes from a very extremely popular book, so it's not, by, it's not very rare because many of them, many copies of this survive. But this to show is by Mattioli, Pietro Mattioli. This to show the great detail, not only of the, uh, the, the depiction of the, of the plants and seeds and developing, but basically it's the first and most important botanical book which was written uh, during the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. uh, most importantly, uh, this book was edited by Swiss Bohen. Uh, was uh, uh, Mario Mattioli, and uh, he was the very first one to to propound the binomial bin binomial uh, d the description of plants, which was taken then later on by Linnaeus. So basically, there is a continuity. That's to show that it's also a continuity in terms of scientific progress or mm -hmm. or history of ideas, basically, not only. So again, it's that progress. those new ideas, those. Uh, Expansion, expansion, and then they get proven, and then they, they generate other ideas and other discoveries. And then everybody else gets uh, scared. <laughs> very often, this is the case. Anytime there is a, an innovation or an invention mm -hmm. or a new ideas put forward immediately, there are people try to put a stop to them. Sometimes rightly, sometimes not. And maybe because they have an investment in the other possibly direction, or because the other way. Yes, or, or because they are grounded in the ideas. Yes. And they cannot see behind that. Yes, yes, they're grounded. That's true. Yeah. Now you even have something uh, in the military arts and the culinary arts. Would you like to talk about military arts first or well, culinary arts? Uh, military arts. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, there were uh, many, many, many. Uh, can we bring up nineteen? Image nineteen. And what uh, can you tell us about this? Well, uh, the art, the military art, of course. Uh, the, the, the books were printed on this on this art. The art is an art. Art, you know, uh, is really is an expertise, so to speak. 
Okay. Even, you, even uh, when we are, we say, I got a master of art. Okay. I'm an expert. I'm a magister artium. Okay. I'm an expert in that particular okay. field. Okay. In that particular field. And so, why would the military so would the military arts be part of something forbidden? No, no, not necessarily. This was was included to show, because okay. to show the, really the progress okay. of science, okay. how science were applied, okay. and mathematical concept. Mathematical concepts. And the projector, the angles of okay. the things, how okay. our fortress could be conquered, uh, how etc. etc. Machine, machine applied to the military okay. warfare, both defensively and offensively. So, that so was actually, there's a historical element. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it, it's the rare historical element, mm. the, and possibly the fact that perhaps, and in, in if, if not. In, in many cases, some of these same ideas hold today. Some of these same ideas may certain, be val certain, valid certain, today certain. that were written in that yes, century. Even then, some people say, oh, this is it's too extreme. We should never use this system mm. to do that or that. Mm. Uh, so that written beyond the, its time, the, the, ahead of the, its time. They're recurrent, yeah, they're recurrent. Uh, and show this, show uh, image number 20, another military arts image of the front of uh, one of the military arts books or the open page. Uh, and this is that same uh, author. Is that the author? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, these the machines were called. Uh, the subtitle it says the the machinis the machinis tormentis. Now they, they were not torture instrument. Really, they were actually <laughs> offensive or mostly offensive machines used to to break a fortress to conquer. Uh, oh. Uh, to, uh, so they weren't machines used for torturing. No, no, not necessarily. They were probably of course, machines. warfare was not really a uh, good thing then either. No. Because everybody got killed or, right. or raped or murdered. Right. Or right. Uh, right. Uh, violence was a crime. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. Should we go into natural science and botanics? Uh, I think we have one picture on natural. Uh, that's uh, 21. Is that natural science? Yes. Oh, yes. This is shows a crystal. Now, this, if I recall, is by Imperato, Ferrante Imperato, who was a, a, a Neapolitan uh, scientist. More than a scientist, he was the very first one who created a museum dedicated to, to sciences or to, to curiosities mm -hmm. or, to, or to minerals or to plants or to, mm -hmm. to strange things that occur in nature. It was a natural museum. And then you had some books that have images representing the occult sciences. I think I only have, do I have one or two images of that here? Uh, I, I know for sure we have this image. Probably only one. Now, uh, this is a, taken from a book from John Battista della Porta, which you all, he was also Napoleon. He was also Napoleon. And then the book is Magia, Nat Magia Naturalis, on the natural magic, basically. And now, saying magic or occult was suspect, of course. You know, witches could be yes, burned. Yes. And this and that. But in this case, he was really a true scientist. He had nothing to do with magic. He actually said that the universe, nature itself, contains so many things that if we succeed in explaining them, so the they, person may, who they may look the like magic, but in reality, they're not magic. They're part okay. of the ordinary uh, system of occult cult. sciences was a little different. It wasn't considered necessarily witchcraft. No, in this case, not. Because no. he dealt mostly okay. with nature. Okay. You know, uh, it was more scientific, memory, maybe chemistry. Memory retention, oh. physiognomy. Okay. He has written beautiful, beautiful books in the report. Okay. Uh, he tried to, for instance, by the way people looked, okay. anticipating some modern idea. Then he said they have certain tendencies to criminality or to, to good deeds or this and that. Mm -hmm. and so Let's try to, I think it's kind of interesting that you have some rare books on culinary recipes and utensils. And also, could you speak briefly to the fact that some foods were considered unacceptable, even though we don't have foods in this picture. Per s well, we do so. Well, what, what happened? The book we have here is by Bartolomeo okay. Scappi. He was uh, 1596. Is it the date? Uh, well, the date isn't on here uh, actually. Uh, if I recall, I mean there were different editions. Uh, he was uh, the head cook for the popes. Oh. Yeah, and uh, so he was a master cook okay. for okay. banquets and everything. I myself in my collection have a book. Uh, Dated a little bit before that, 1560, also by another cook, master cook. Okay, the and popes. then he put up the uh, uh, with under some utensils yes. and things. Oh, yeah, and you see how, in a way, there is a uh, it was a scientific process again, mm -hmm. and the scientific process was basically this: yes, that, yes, uh, that you have a you have a theory, you have a recipe, yes. basically. If you follow the recipe, 
the formula basically. Yes. You should, should get over and over the pretty much the same yes. results. Yes. So anyway, this was scientific process also in the cooking, which it was not just a matter of surviving mm -hmm. anymore, but was you know, mm -hmm. impressive. I know they're trying to include cooking as part of the curriculum uh, for, I mean, as part of the chemistry to help children understand yeah, chemistry, yeah. Uh -huh. they do incorporate uh, cooking, uh, and it's a fun way why not? Why to not? understand why chemistry. Yeah. Now, I know you also have a topic called universal knowledge, and that's uh, number 23 image. The universal knowledge basically refers to the, some books that were put in the exhibit that dealt with, again, general, general uh, knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, the state of knowledge at that time. Uh, so the encyclopedic concept, of course we know the encyclopedia came much later, mm -hmm. the true encyclopedias, you know, in the 18th century, some actually in the 17th century, Bale uh, did the first ones uh, around 1690 or so, the first edition, then there was the French encyclopedia, then and so forth and so forth. We have so it. universal knowledge is considered kind of a generic term? Well, uh, or uh, yes, generic in this way, but mm -hmm. it was, was a the idea that knowledge had become important. Okay, and knowledge and above knowledge all. Knowledge on all its yes. aspects yes. had to become important. Yes. And it had to be preserved yes. and given to people who were really interesting to we We're running out of time. Uh, again, I'd like to remind the public out there that we're talking about uh, the exhibit of Forbidden Books, which is currently at the Loyola University Museum of Art. And we are talking with the curator, Dr. Roberto Severino, out of Georgetown University. Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, he has shared with us some of these rare books and some of these topics uh, uh, that were threatening to the people of the 1500s, 1600s, even 1700s, mm -hmm. and not just the Italian culture, but um, many of the Euro all of the European cultures, probably. Um, and so, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having Dominus <laughs>